thanks for taking time to sit down with me and answer some questions that we are sent in by the current students, um, you know, about kind of career prospects in sport, um, exercise and health industry, um, and, and the great work that you guys um, do at Health by Science. I'm sure that will um, come up quite, quite a lot throughout the interview. But basically the idea behind this mini interview series of sports practitioners is um, to give aspiring students and practitioners um, an insight into what, what it takes and what it's like to be working with a wide range of clients and athletes, if that's applicable. Um, and I have no doubt that um, the listeners will, will benefit hugely from your experience, um, thoughts and advice. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start with the most basic question. Um, if you could give us an overview of your background and journey in sport and exercise science, um, that, would be, that would be ideal. Yeah. Um, yeah, I guess probably, well, I don't think there's probably a typical route into sports science, but I know, I know for me, being, I've been in the industry for over 10 years now, so a bit older when there wasn't probably the same number of jobs or career paths as there is now. Um, so I, I had no, in, not an interest, but I had no uh, plans to go into sports science. Uh, I enjoyed it. I enjoyed, uh, you know, PE at school, enjoyed sports, always been active, but I just didn't see a career. So uh, I knew I didn't want to be a PE teacher. Uh, so aside from that, I wasn't, I couldn't see a huge amount of, of other opportunities. Uh, so I, I had no plans at school to, to, to get into sports science or, or exercise or, or health or anything like that. Um, I, I joined the gym, was probably the first sort of insight into that world when I was, was 15. Um, even then though, I didn't take, didn't take PE um, until I'd be fifth year. So I didn't do standard grade PE uh, just because I, I didn't see the relevance. I thought I was, at the time I was going to join the police. So I thought I'm, I'm just going to do that. Um, so yeah, I, I had no incline into it. I did PE and did, did reasonably well, enjoyed it. I, I then came to the end of, of school and thought I'm going to do something, study something, so I've got something to fall back on if, if police didn't work out. And then that's when I went in to do my diploma uh, in fitness, health and exercise initially. And that was purely just because I didn't do very well at school, didn't have a huge amount of, of um, interest in, in other subjects. Looking back, it was probably always going to end up this way, but I just didn't, I didn't see it because I couldn't see the, the sort of end jobs. So I was trying to be almost too rational and logical around it. Um, but when it came to study, and that was the only thing that interested me, I was getting really into training, really into the performance, um, and I just wanted to learn more. So I thought if I do it, at least I'll hopefully do reasonably well and then, um, and then see from there. But I, I still had no plans in, in using that qualification. Um, so looking back, I was. At the age of like 15, I was reading textbooks, I was reading the sense of the strength and conditioning, and, but still not kind of putting two and two together. Um, so yeah, when I did my diploma, um, I then I did well, so got, got an A for the diploma and then went and worked for, for two years in a gym. After that, or during that time, I could sort of see different avenues. And this was when PTs were becoming a bit more popular. Uh, nutrition field was beginning to grow and I could see there was some maybe some sort of career in it um, I always liked the idea of working or setting up a business so the more I kind of went down that route working in a gym uh, I started to consider a bit more about what might come out of it um, so I just used those two years that worked in a gym to just learn the craft to spend as much time working with people um, all walks of life so the gym was at with physio referrals uh, we had a lot of opportunities to work with uh, different community projects. So things like uh, social care and, and homeless shelters and, and things like that. I loved all of it, but it was brilliant. Um, then towards the end of that, I got a job as a, a gym supervisor at another facility. At this point, then I was thinking, yeah, the goal would now be to, to make, make my own uh, or start my own business at this point would be uh, just learn as much as I can and, and now make a career of it. So I sort of ditched the the police and any other ideas I had and just sort of, right, I'll go for it. If it doesn't work out, I can always fall back on it. So did that for, for a couple of years. That gave me an insight into to gym management and to dealing with kit suppliers, dealing with, uh, you know, uh, 
staff, so managing a team. I was the youngest in the team as well, so there's a lot of challenges there. I learned a lot about like customer psychology, so I got an insight into retention among sites, um, a lot of that, that sort of things. That was two years, and I'd had a sort of cap in my head of after two years, I would get out and do something. Didn't know exactly what, but I knew that I didn't want to keep climbing the ladder because the higher up the ladder you go, the further removed you are from face to face. And that was what I enjoyed. So I knew that for me was the ceiling within that organization, um, at which point I would have to either start my own business um, or move move careers. So I got to end of two years. And then that's when we set up or met, uh, along with my two colleagues, we set up Health by Science, uh, which timed, timed well. Uh, at the same time, I then went back to to studying. So my plan was always, I liked the study and I enjoyed studying it, uh, studying fitness, health, exercise, sport. But for PT, it's a pretty low barrier to entry. So you don't need a huge amount of qualifications. So I'd always want to go back, but go back when I was, it wasn't maybe going to have a knock on effect to what I was doing at the time. So because I was, I was doing the supervisor role, that required a lot of time. So I knew as soon as I did stop that and was able to kind of set up on business that have a bit more flexibility. So that's when I went back to do the, do the degree. Um, and then I think, well, so yes, yeah, so we started the company up five, five or six years ago. And then three years ago, we opened uh, our first facility. Um, and then during that sort of window of time, I also worked uh, within sport, just through, through kind of networking, uh, worked mainly in hockey um, and had the pleasure of going to the under uh, 18s, the Scottish Hockey Euros, um, and then a few other other bits and pieces that we did, which was was, was good. And then, yeah, that's been the last yeah five or six years now. It's been uh, solely working on on health by science, which we'll probably chat about in a, in a bit. Great. Been... Um, so one of the things I'm really curious and interested in when when I talk to uh different folks, practitioners, is their, their guiding philosophy or philosophy that they take and, and, you know, apply working with colleagues, clients, you kind of alluded to it briefly, but what, what is, how would you, how would you describe your gu guiding? And I kind of, I use that word guiding because it may be training, it may, may not be training philosophy, and it, it may not be coaching, but, but the, the, the values that you actually bring to your day-to-day um, work and and then who 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 informed that them who and what informed it the most? Uh, yeah, tricky one. I I guess guidance philosophy would probably be I probably look at a bigger picture. A lot of the principles can be taught. So a lot of the, the the performance side of things can be taught. I think for me, one of the big things would be just honesty. So having an people you interact with, being honest with them, being honest with clients. Um, I think people respect that a lot more. And it says a lot about character, being able to accept when you're when you're wrong and being willing to change opinions. Um, so I think, yeah, there's gen general honesty with yourself and people that, you, that you're working with as well. Um, we obviously, we have a large emphasis on being evidence-based, which is a bit of a buzzword at the moment. But for us, I guess it is, it probably ties into that honesty is using, um, you know, empirical research, but then also experiential research. So um, being willing to 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 use evidence to guide your thinking, but also using uh, experience as well. Um, I guess that probably tied back to honesty is, is professional. Is I suppose maybe not as much in in things like strength conditioning, but definitely personal training because there is a low barrier to entry. One of the big challenges is that it does lack professionalism. Um, so one of the things that we're, that we're trying to do, uh, because it, me it means and matters a lot to us, is carrying yourself in a professional way. So the details do matter. So being on time, carrying yourself in a certain way, and, and managing your own emotions. Like I think, especially now with like Instagram and stuff, it's, it's kind of idolised what like PTs do. But at the end of the day, there's like anything, there's shit parts of the job. But you just need to you just need to deal with it. And if you're a sub, you know, if you subject to your emotions at a time, uh, people pick up on that. And that's not 
you know, that's not ultimately going to serve you well in the future. So I think just making sure that you are professional. So in terms of how you how you got to this point, you know, again, going back to that kind of philosophy, what is is it just literally through experiences? Is it individual? Is it lots of reading? Obviously, you said you you use obviously an evidence based approach. Is it how is always a combination of all those different factors that are kind of fed into your current philosophy? Yeah, I think probably yeah probably a combination of that. Like I, I guess personal interest, but then also my I don't. Personally, I've always been interested in a lot of different things. So I've always been uh, keen to just try things. So whether that is um, you know, working with more clinical populations, if that's working in sport, if that's working with students, whatever that, whatever it is, there's not probably one thing that I would would want to do all the time. And that's probably why, I guess, looking back, ultimately, it was always going to you know, work with the team that I'm in now um, because that allows, allows me or has allowed me to to do that um, so i think probably probably a combination of that just interest and being uh being as open to opportunities as possible so i think creating your own opportunities and just trying a bit of everything um so that you can i guess you can you can just test and see you know you get more of an idea of things you like things you don't like um the things like i guess the working in sport that was just through just opportunities and things and just trying to Trying to get as much experience as possible. What, what are your thoughts on the fact that people are generally not open to opportunities? <laughs> what, 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 what's the reason behind that? Do you think it, is it? Are they just scared that they don't like to leave the comfort zone? Uh, yeah, it's a difficult one, isn't it? I, again, I think there is probably like everybody is different. Um, I think there's definitely a, you know there's probably chat about a bit later on but like that fear of failure is real for everybody um i think it's just i suppose sometimes you might look at things and just see the potential negative opposed to seeing a potential positive and even if you can't see the positive sometimes there's merit in just putting yourself forward anyway because i guess i would look back on things that i've done where if you were to ask me before i wouldn't have seen a positive but then something good has actually come out of it um so i think it's just you don't know what you don't know and just being open to that alone can be really powerful right speaking of positive negatives if you could summarize the ups and downs that you've had to date in your in your career and obviously here you know you're covering i think the, what, what impresses me the most about what you guys do you're covering a really wide range and i'm sure you'll 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 give us um, more details but you cover sport you cover exercise and you cover health so and i think that that is that is really impressive um, but if you had to uh, outline a few or, or key um, kind of ups and key key downs, you know, the most rewarding and most challenging things. And, and you mentioned that, I suppose, social media am amplifies the, the, the positives only uh, without actually uh, showing the reality and then complex reality behind it. So what would you say personally to you? What, what's been... That the kind of highlight and 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 the lowest point, I suppose. Yeah, I think probably where my it's probably not <laughs> maybe something we need to work on. I know we're not great at celebrating a lot of the successes. It's definitely you're always thinking about what's next. I think my mind usually goes to what have been the challenges and and then what have you overcome. Um, I think definitely one of the most challenging things is when we were uh, initially setting up the business. Uh, because we had, I was obviously doing the full-time study while we we're trying to get up and running. It's the same now where if you're freelance, you would pay rent. So we had that expenditure coming out where you're trying to get enough to, to make rent, enough to make a revenue uh, for the company and then grow the company to a position where we could could get space while, um, while studying full-time. When we got the facility, that was definitely a, it was good because we'd been looking for a while and it was a huge milestone, but you didn't really acknowledge it uh, at the time because we had such a short timeline that we needed to get things renovated and up and running, turn in a profit, um, which coincided with final year of study. So you're doing like dissertation while uh, while uh, trying to renovate and try to get this gym up and running while I was also still working as a trainer at another gym. So it'd be between uni, between 
by work chairman between this new new place. Um, so dealing with you know tradesmen, kit suppliers, all the rest, trying to get that while trying to deal with you know clients and the business, and then trying to deal with um, degree. Um, so that was definitely a, a, probably one of the, the toughest times uh, we had during that time. I had two gyms that we were working at close. So when a gym closes, we had to then find somewhere else to go. You don't know if all your clients are going to come with you. There's all that um, that goes along with it. Um, that was definitely a challenge. I guess the flip side of that was there was a bit of relief once we'd opened. Um, you know, once we've, we'd got to that point, I'd, um, you know, finished the degree, so we'd graduated, um, and then we opened. But again, even then, you're still looking at, well, we need, you know, this year we've got to hit X numbers. We've got to, you know, we've got to fill the space. Um, so I think that was good looking back, but at the time probably didn't acknowledge it. Um, and then I, I guess a big one for us was when we've made our first full-time hire. That was definitely a big step because we're in a, a, a more comfortable position and we were able to, obviously, it's a, we take as big responsibility that you're, you know, you're paying someone's wages that you need to be sure in what you're doing. Uh, so that, that was definitely a moment that we took to, you know, just take a step back and look at, well, we've, we've managed to create something that's been of use to um, be able to provide, you know, work for somebody else that um, have grown. But again, it is, it's definitely something that, you know, myself and a colleague are working on because we're not great at maybe acknowledging what we've done. It's just thinking about what we're doing next. So what are you going to do to start celebrating your successes a bit more? Have, have you started celebrating successes a bit more or is still not celebrating? So we do, we try and, we, yeah, we, we're getting a bit better. We do, we've done some team away days and stuff. Um, and we, we, we obviously meet regularly and we're trying to do things like wins of the week where we are forcing ourselves to acknowledge, well, we've got this huge list of things that need to get done and things that are uh, you know, evolving and transpiring, but then also looking back at well, what are the wins, and that uh, that itself is that's a weird, but it's still a bit of a challenge because you're like, yeah, it's a win, but there's this and there's that, but it's it's a work in progress, it's definitely better. Yeah. Than Speaking of competitiveness, isn't that like, mm. yeah, it's, it's all about more more work and more competition for you guys. Um, I just want to ask you a few questions. So, kind of moving more into. Uh, the actual work of clients, um, and 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 you touched very early on. You touched uh, upon customer psychology, so I'm sure will will come up um, shortly. How do you how do you deal with a lack of clients or participants or players buy-in? So so for example, you know if if we look. Um, you know, you guys work with such a broad range of clients, but if you look from sports performance point of view, there are some traditions and deeply ingrained cultures in some of the sports whereby players don't want to do, you know, resistance training or strength and conditioning in general, whatever. So in your experience, and then similarly, you will have similar um challenges and issues i suppose um working with general population um so how do you actually go about getting that buy-in from them yeah i think i suppose from a, a sporting context but definitely i know what you mean in terms of the the cultures um that is i suppose buy-in is so crucial in order for people to to get rewards if, if somebody doesn't buy into it, you know, there's even like a placebo effect and things factor in that if they don't believe in it and, or if they do believe in it, there's not going to affect. Um, I guess I've always tried to take the approach of probably ties back to the honesty is to facilitate and not dictate. Um, it's definitely something that, you know, we're definitely not the trainers that are standing, making people do stuff and shouting at them, you know, the kind of military style it is very much a co-design. Um, and that's probably where maybe sport was slightly trickier, whereas if you do have outcomes that you need to hit um, and you've got people or athletes you're working with that are uh, that you're rubbing up against, that can definitely be maybe present different challenges. But I've always taken the approach that it's facilitate and, and, and not dictate to people. And with that comes the reaffirming like the goals in the process. So if somebody's not wanting to do something or doesn't, you know, doesn't think it's going to be useful. 
I guess it's taking the time to understand, well, you know, what is the goal? And then uh, what is it, that, you know, what are your apprehensions about what we are doing? And because a lot of times people just might not see how that, how what you're asking them to do ties into the goal. You know, if somebody doesn't see, um, you know, I don't know, nutrition being the biggest key to fat loss or whatever it is, then, well, they're not going to, they might not be meaning to be abrasive. They just might not place the same emphasis. Whereas if you can acknowledge that, hear them out, and then, you know, work with them to say, or to work with them to affirm, right, this is what we'd take in order to do that. You might find out that either it wasn't a goal or you have won them round by the point that they go, okay, that is part of the process to get me to that goal that I am certain is the goal. Um, so I think for us, yeah, it's definitely trying to facilitate a work with people uh, to, to affirm what is the goal and then how, how do you want to get there? So in terms of working with, again, it's, 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 it's probably a, an absolute norm. You know, some, some clients will demonstrate and, and have a greater buy-in than others. Um, and you've worked for you with however many um, of those clients. Um, how, how do you change the practice? So, you know, just, just in general, as well as the buy-in. So how, how, how do you adjust the, your approach in order to get the maximum out of the clients and uh, including the buy, including that, you know, so I, I totally agree with what you, what you just said um, in terms of facilitating, I think you used the word co-design, which is quite, it's quite interesting, but that doesn't, that doesn't guarantee a hundred percent success all the time, does it? No. Um, so, so how do you, how do you change? Can you think of it like, I know I'm, I'm putting you on the spot here, but can you think of specific examples where that's a nice case study to obviously without going into too much details and, 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 and naming um, obviously the clients, but so this worked brilliantly in that situation where I've tried something, tried a method, tried a different approach, whatever it may have been. Yeah, I think, um, I suppose, going back to that, it's probably managing the expectations of yourself and them as well. So, Initially, I would have thought, and with my assumption would be, oh, you can get quote unquote results with everybody, and and you know you can achieve whatever you want. But then, if somebody, you know, if I see somebody for two hours a week, even there's still a lot of other hours in the week that if they're not on board, it doesn't ultimately doesn't matter. Um, so I think managing their expectations of what they can achieve is big as well. So we'll never over promise. We're, we're very kind of, I guess, um, we try and manage that by. By, you know explaining what we can and can't do um, and managing your own expectations because that can be very frustrating when people don't do what you know they, they could achieve um, but then that might just be from miscommunication um, in terms of I guess examples so I guess a classic example that we see quite a lot is uh, with, with dieting so a lot of people will have tried well everybody's tried dieting at some point and will have uh, you know different mental anchorings to different diets and I guess a classic one we would see is I've done whatever diet, Weight Watchers, Paleo, whatever it is, uh, the fasting diet. And it worked really well for me, uh, but I just couldn't stick to it. So there's a lot of people blame themselves and will uh, maybe not necessarily be able to, to look at the diet for what it was. So we know that, right, that probably wasn't the case, probably just didn't really work well for you. Because if it was that good, you'd still be doing it now. And you wouldn't be in a position where you're talking about it, you know, a year or two ago where you put on for example, if it is weight loss, you put on that weight. But if somebody is still, you know, shut up, you're not going to get through to them just by saying, you know, that diet's nonsense. You know, here's here's why it didn't work. You kind of need to work with them. So it might be the case of getting them, okay, if they really want to do this diet, then you know ultimately probably isn't going to succeed. That's fine. But let's let's do it together. So I'm going to be on your team. I'm going to be doing it with, you know, I'm going to be encouraging you the whole way. But by doing that, we can then sit down and, and analyze it together. So we can chat about, right, what's gone well this week? Or you didn't manage to do that. Why was it? To kind of help them see, well, actually, maybe it's not the best diet for me. There's things I liked about it. There's things that ultimately meant that it wasn't sustainable. Um, whereas previously, you know, maybe kind of newly graduate, I would definitely have just been of the approach of like, I've got all this knowledge. You should know what I know. And if you know what I know, then you'll do it. But it doesn't work like that. So it's, it's almost exercising a bit more patience um, and working with the person, even if it is 
taking a step back at him. Right. Um, I, I, I suppose that goes back to the one of the values you outlined earlier is obviously honesty in terms of being being honest in terms of managing so managing the client's expectations. Um, I, I think is is very you know important point that you made, um, but an even more important point that you made managing your own expectations if someone isn't progressing or reaching the goals as quickly as you expect. How do you go about doing that? That's, I'd say that's, that's arguably harder because it's easier to manage, or it's not easy, but it's easier to manage someone else's expectation because the worst case scenario is that they, uh, that they would leave or that they wouldn't, you know, if we get an inquiry and somebody expects something and, and in that initial consultation, we explain what we can and can't do. If they don't like it, they're not, they're not going to come on board. But if you have a, a perception of what you think they should be doing or what you want them to achieve, or, or even just the frustrations of seeing the same cycles repeated, um, that is, I would say, is much more challenging. Um, I guess there isn't, I can't think of a quick fix. Um, we, we talk about it a lot um, on the team is we've all got clients like that. Um, you know, there's even some conversations we've had at what point is it not the best thing for them to be with you? You know, what at what point do you do you not get rid of, but do you guide somebody to to not be using our services? Obviously, we you know we in our industry you're kind of held up as having the answers for everything, but sometimes I think it is okay to say this is outside of, of my remit, or we've just tried. Like I've tried everything we can. If there's ultimately still the goal, you know, we've had however long trying and it's not working. It, I'm probably not the person for you, um, which is very difficult to do. Um, but it is, I suppose it is case by case as to who you would have those conversations with and who you wouldn't with. Yeah, it's, it's amazing what you're saying there because obviously you guys are client, well, client driven and client centered, you know, business. So for you to say that it actually gets to the point where you may guide them to, Hmm. To, to leave your services is, is it, it takes a lot of courage and it takes a lot of honesty, doesn't it? But what, what, mm. what, what pushes you to that, <laughs> to that, to that absolute extreme? I think that by nature, I guess, personal training and physiotherapy, you're, you have to wear a whole range of hats. And the same as you would in sport, you've got to wear a whole range of hats where you do need uh, skills in you know, speaking with people, you need motivational interview, you need all these kind of these core skills. But also you have to remember where you may think that your goal is just to implement training and nutrition. But at the same time, if you spend an hour or two hours a week with somebody, you are also an impartial third party, which is the same role that a therapist would play, the same role that, you know, that other professionals would play. So by default, you might become you might end up, whether you know it or not, become more of that role. And that's just, that's natural because if you spend that time with somebody, you're gonna build some form of a rapport. You're gonna know, you know, about these people, they're gonna know about you. And, and if somebody feels comfortable to, to share things, you can slowly transition into more of a therapist role, you know, more of a, that, uh, that is outside of a remit, which I guess when you say, what is the point? Uh, what is the point at which it changes? there isn't a clear point and that's the difficulty i think and that's where um i guess some people might just try and come up with answers that they that they're not equipped to do uh whereas i guess what why we can urge people to do is if you feel that way you feel that you're at your depth you feel that it's outside your remit is have that conversation um which again is easier said than done and there isn't a clear point for it but i think it's just the fact of just being aware that you may with some clients you might end up in that position um definitely something that i would never have thought about years ago when i first started never thought about that. but it makes sense okay. right it makes sense that you would you know you would um those lines can become blurred right give us a give us a bit of the flavor in terms of the, the um obviously i've known you for quite quite a few years now um, I'm glad to call you a friend. Obviously, our friendship kind of lasted, and hopefully, it, it will last. But for the listeners, in in terms of the the, the things that we were saying, that you guys cover a range of different areas. 
Um, give us a bit of the flavor of what, what that looks like without going into too, too much detail. So in my, in my mind, the way I see you do sports, even not the primary domain, you do exercise and do health. So just kind of almost linking what, what, you, you've, what we've been discussing here in terms of like the goods and the bads in each of those areas. Um, maybe there are commonalities, maybe uh, they, they're different, you know, it may be uh, down to the age group, the, the population. So certainly for, from health point of view and, 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 and the stuff that you do that, um, you know, stroke patients obviously may be, their underlying conditions, the age, you know, that kind of stuff. If you could, if you could summarize the work that you guys do in <laughs> in, a, in a short sentence or two, that, that would be amazing. Yeah. yeah, I think it changes how I describe this on a weekly basis. But um, I guess at, at the heart of it, we so we're first of all physiotherapy, social enterprise. So we our backbone is general population personal training. Um, and and physiotherapy, the social enterprise arm is that we we do it with a, a social purpose. So uh, at at the moment, that is the work that we do with uh, stroke survivors. Um, aside from that, we also work with a social care company where we do a workplace health and wellness program. So that is largely online. Um, we do some in person stuff, but mainly mainly online working with staff improve the health and well-being of staff but then also the health and well-being of the people they support as a kind of sub project of that we do have people that are in support coming into the to the gym uh, to work one-on-one -on -one with trainers so we we work with um, people in social care so that might be people with uh, mental illnesses it could be somebody with uh, it could be a, a, you know chronic arthritis it could be anyone anyone who needs uh, or who has care um, we also do within the lab, we do uh, sports massage as well, as that ties in with one of our recovery tools for, for people. Um, that would be probably the main, I guess, services. And then I guess how they tie in, I suppose uh, the simplest way in terms of, of training, working with these different domains would be the the I always like the quote, methods are many, principles are few, methods may change, but principles rarely do, is that no matter if you have a stroke survivor or you have an athlete, a lot of those fundamental principles are the same. So if, um, you know, the movement patterns, for example, so if we want, everybody's going to benefit from doing squat, pull, push, uh, push, pull, hinge, some single leg movements, all these things, what that looks like is going to be different, but the principle is still the same. So a stroke survivor might be doing a sit to stand, now that would be their squat pattern. An athlete might be doing a heavy back squat. It's still a squat. It's still a, you know, still FME flexion. It's still the exact same movement. Um, but but one is, you know, one is a stroke survivor. One is, um, you know, an elite level athlete. But the the principle is still the same. And I think that that's probably where we try to kind of wear different hats in terms of being able to work across all these domains because it is probably most confusing for marketing is that if you just do one thing in your niche, it's a hell of a lot easier to advertise for and to um, and to build a business. Whereas if you do a lot of things, we can say that obviously, yeah, they do cross over and, and actually by working across these domains, our trainers and practitioners are going to be better because they've got more experience of just, just general experience of working across broader domains. Um, I mean, that's probably... So that's maybe one example, but it's not. Um, Sorry, I just want to go back. Firstly, is that quote by Ross Marwick? <laughs> no, no. Who is that okay. quote by? Because I've never heard of him. No. I like, um, it. I like it. You'll, yeah, you'll have to send me the, the details or <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll have to Google after. Uh, Sorry, I was going to say, it's one of the ones we, we use to describe um, our stance on a lot of uh, what we would call tools. So if you look at things like in PT, it was always like there's a kettlebell guy, there's a CrossFit guy, there's this guy, there's that guy. They are just tools and they're methods. They're not they're not bending principles. They are just methods. Right. So I think it's, I like it's quite that. a good way to look at things agnostic. Just 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 repeat that for I mean I, 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 just repeat <laughs> that for <laughs> for the listeners. Uh, so 
Yeah, I thought it was going forward. As your methods are many, principles are few. Methods may change, but principles rarely do. Very good. I'll, I'll have to steal that off you. Um, <laughs> and then, and the second, the second question is, is going a, a step back. So, would you describe yourself? And I'm, I, I, hopefully, I picked picked that correctly. So, would would you describe yourself as still a specialist, generalist, or generalist specialist? <laughs> Uh, because what, the, the reason I'm asking that, what you what you said, you know, you cover a wide range, but what you just said a moment ago, you said that you're still, for the marketing purposes, you still go with the specialist approach, right? Am I right in saying that, or did I misinterpret it? So we, I guess, depending what. So if we're looking for, um, you know, uh, strokes of virus, for example, then we would. The, the market and say would have to be specific to them because there's no point, it's not relative, relevant to them seeing, although we can describe it, that, you know, there's similarities, seeing an athlete isn't going to resonate with that person in the same way that, uh, you know, having us even, you know, I've not, I've not had a stroke, no one on our team has had a stroke, so just advertising ourselves isn't going to help. So in terms of the marketing, you do have to be uh, specific. I guess what I mean in there is that if your company is specialist, so if you specialize, say if we only work for stroke survivors, that would probably be better and easier to market because our website could just be about that. Our website would just be about that. As soon as you click on it, that's all you get. Whereas it's not, so it's quite, it's a bit of a, more of a balancing act to, to demonstrate what you do without putting people off and without pigeonholing you into to one area. So you are a generalist specialist. Yeah. 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 Interesting. Right. We could be talking forever and ever and ever, as always. <laughs> um, I think we need to move on to some of their key tips and advice, um, kind of career advice for the aspiring students um, or, or, or anyone interested in either switching careers, going into, into the, you know, sport, exercise and health industry, whatever, whatever their motivations may be uh, behind that. So um, just before we actually like kind of go into the advice, um, and, I've, and I've spoken to a number of students, recent graduates, um, and even practitioners who've been in the industry for quite a few years. And, and uh, one of the themes that comes up, one of the topics that does come up is the imposter syndrome and actually how many people have suffered, if not still suffer from um, imposter syndrome. H have you ever, have you ever thought about it? Have you ever, would you say that you've ever suffered whatever the word suffer means in this context uh, from from the imposter syndrome mm -hmm. yeah i think everybody has a knowledge or not um i think personally 100 percent uh probably near daily basis for imposter syndrome um <laughs> i think um yeah definitely 100 percent uh i think in terms of i don't know i think it, some of it can be dangerous to assume that you will at some point not have it is probably where I've, I've sort of leveled out is is if you assume that it will at some point you'll get to a destination where you no longer come from it uh, suffer from imposter syndrome I would argue that you're probably not putting yourself out there enough you're probably not you know pushing things forward enough I think it's it can be good can be healthy but it's it is um it's definitely a challenge I've, I guess I can only speak personally but I I've probably found just having that internal dialogue, uh, you know, what is it that you feel is your perceived shortcomings that is leading to this, this feeling of imposter syndrome, because you obviously, that feeling is that your skill set doesn't match up with the tasks that you're, that you're trying to do. And even sometimes that alone, you might still come to the point where actually I still feel under quit, but actually just coming to actually addressing it. And then it might just be a case of accepting it. It's just, okay that's fine, move on. It's just, it is an emotion, it's a feeling that, that you'll have. Um, whereas I, I definitely think the opposite, which I've definitely been guilty of previously would be, at some point, I won't feel this way. At some point, I, I'll be I'll get rid of imposter syndrome. So so what helped you? So I, I suppose you answered the, um, the, 
the next question in terms of how you overcome, how you deal with it, you know, quite quite nicely. Um, and you try to, like you said, it's like if you're not having an imposter syndrome, that you probably maybe not maybe not learning, maybe not interested enough anymore, that kind of stuff. But at one point, did you realize that this is the um, this is the way to deal with it? Do you know what I mean? At, at one point you know, that internal dialogue, that acceptance became a norm for you. And what, did you remember the moment? Or, it, or it's just, again, a learning and then it's like, oh, actually, I'm okay. I'm, I'm happy to to deal with this big beast um, on a daily basis. I definitely not. There wasn't a particular moment in time. I think I've always done some form of reflection, whether it's written or internal reflection. And I think that knowing that, that can sometimes help appease those feelings, doesn't necessarily make them go away, but it definitely helps. I think putting two and two together of that practice alone of just reflecting on how you're feeling and, and why you're feeling that way um, can help. But I think it'll vary because I've you know there's there's situations I might you know I'll be in where that'll still be an overwhelming feeling at the time. But it's now I guess just trying to make sure that you take the time to to try and dial into why it is you feel that way and then having a level of acceptance. But there definitely there's not there was no tipping point in terms of feeling that but I suppose the, the one of the methods so you have that internal dialogue, but one of the methods is is self self-reflection, is is reflective practice, whether it is, you know, um creative writing, writing it down in a journal diary, whether it is self talk, internal dialogue, but the clearly is a, is a method to potentially deal with that, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, and I think there's, there's probably like the, the Dunning-Kruger effect as well, is that actually people who don't suffer from it probably aren't, don't either know enough or are not um, maybe as, uh, they're maybe not as self-critical or analytical. So there's, right. there's, I guess there's two sides to it. One is gonna serve you in some aspects, the way that you obviously care, because if you didn't care, then you wouldn't feel that, you know, feel that emotion. But then the flip side is that, well, you know, just talk to yourself out of it. You feel like you're you're not worthy of whatever it is that you're trying to do. Um, so I think trying to not just see it as a negative, but actually see, well, what's the flip side of it? Well, the fact that you actually give a shit is, yeah. is positive. You know, the fact that you are caring you know, about you it. want, yeah, that you want to do a good job is that yeah. alone is is a positive. Um, doesn't take the emotion away, but it helps you understand. I guess rationalize it is, is why you feel that way is it's for a reason and there's posits to that as well right um moving on uh, last few questions one of the one of the most interesting questions i was going to ask you now you did say that obviously you know the company has grown going from strength to strength which is brilliant to, to hear and you actually guys started employing other people which which is which is fantastic you're creating jobs right um one of the big topics at uh, in kind of high education academia uh, is employability, employability skills. Based on your experiences as as an employer, right, and and you you you've been out of out of university for quite a few years, so you know you, you definitely have the first hand experience seeing students coming on doing placements, internships, as well as actually employing people, right. What would you? What would be your honest, a brutally honest opinion um, in terms of the biggest gaps in the skills and knowledge of the recent graduates? Yeah, it's a, it's a difficult one. I think because I look back into, you know, I'm not to do a CV for, I don't know, I don't even know how many years I'm not to, to do a CV. So it's it's trying to look at. It, uh, from what would my CV look like? What would I do? It's, it's no, no, but like what I mean is like you are now on the other side of the table. So you, you know, I don't want to make you a, a relative comparison. It's like you know, when I graduated, you know, from you know from undergraduate in you know BSc in sport and exercise science, this is where I was at in comparison to person B or someone else. But it's it's mainly almost from what you see. Um, yeah, yeah. Because you, you did have students, as far as I can tell, you did have students come in shadow, obviously, you or you probably do now, you know, thinking of, again, growing that part of your business, and, and which is brilliant because, you know, it allows the students to bridge that gap, mm -hmm. right? 
but in terms of your uh, purely as an employer's from employer's point of view what would you say are the biggest gaps and i know it's really tricky because it varies and it's an individual cv isn't it it's an individual skill set that they bring but surely you can kind of generalize and summarize it um, you know in 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 a way yeah yeah no definitely no i, I guess i'm just i suppose trying to preface it from the point of view of like i've i've not been in that position for a very long time so it is i definitely have a huge amount of sympathy or empathy for people that um you know are in that position and i suppose we are because we, we we are varied in what we're doing what we would look for might not be what every other employer would look for i guess from our perspective would be the varied in experience so i think definitely something that we've seen recently has just been uh one domain so if that's sport the sport is your your interest that's fine but then even if sport is where you ultimately want to end up, if all your CV is just just sport, um, I guess for us that is something that would 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 go against you. Um, and even in sport, I guess. So if you are studying, uh, you've got massive opportunities to shadow because if you're a student, that gets you in any door because you can say, oh, "I want to come in and do some work experience." That, that's not the same once you've graduated. So actually, when you're studying, it's a, it's a good time to do it. And if you've had experience of, I don't know, working with rehab or clinical populations or whatever it is, that might not be your sole interest. Ultimately, that might be the tipping point for you getting a job. Because if you're working, I don't know, going for a, even if it's a, a team sport, you go for a team sport and you're going to be working closely in a multidisciplinary team, you know, gone are the days where you're just going to be in the, you know, in the gym working with, you know, uninjured elite athletes, you're going to have injuries and things like that. So if you're, not demonstrating that through your experience yes you could say oh my course covers this but that theory what's your practical experience in those realms so i think varied experience is important um obviously having a, a sole interest is fine so if it's s and c your background is s and c but having very um a varied experience and then staying staying active in your cv um, or in your your experience because if you study for you know two, three, four years, five years, however long it is, that that has a potential been a massive block of time that is just your course. So if somebody doesn't value that course or you're going for a job and someone else has that exact same qualification, but has also, you know, interned, has also done a bunch of CPD, has also done all these other things, then they're going to take that person because it shows initiative. Um, I think, like, my experience full-time study is not, full time, you know, there's many hours in a day that you can do a lot of other stuff and an impressive uh, applicant would be somebody who's, yeah, I've done this study and I've maybe worked the job that wasn't relevant, that's fine because you've, you know, you've got to pay the bills. Then I've also done, for my evenings, I did this with, you know, I was also doing this course alongside it. That says more about, uh, obviously, a broad skill set, but then the person that's applying shows that there is drive, there is, you know, there is passion there. Great. That, that quite nicely leads us on to the final, final question. And we've majorly overrun. Um, what, what is your one final piece of advice to any aspiring sports practitioner? Um, I think probably going back to the imposter stuff is, is to reflect often. So do your self-reflection. Um, then that might be reflected on uh, jobs that you've gone for and not got. That might be reflecting if you're you know doing work experience or interning and um, that might be just even reflection on interactions so if you've been working with an athlete or general population it's not gone well or it has gone well what was it because you want to the better you can get at, at diagnosing that then the better the more likely you are to do more of the stuff that worked well and less the stuff that didn't and um, so i think ref reflecting often doesn't have to be written can be you know can even be in your own head um yeah but just having some sort of self-awareness and reflection. Um, that, and I guess more so for probably the sport is like understanding is a bit of a game, right? It's not personal. So the jobs you get and don't get all these things, I think you, you've got to have thick skin. Uh, you've got to just learn from it and move on. So everybody will experience rejection and failure and all that stuff is just play the game. Don't take it personally. Uh, uh, the game. 
Listen, great talking to you. I really, really appreciate you taking time to, uh, to share your um, experiences and insights. Um, and yeah, it's, um, as always, it's a pleasure. Um, and, and I actually got quite a lot from it. Uh, don't forget to send me the quote. But I'll, I'll, uh, I'll remember the quote as, as a quote by Ross Marwick from now on. <laughs> I appreciate it, man. Thank you very Thanks, much. Thanks, Ross. Take care, man.